Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to live home in the community, Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, and Montpelier Sustainable Coalition, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Able Then On Air has been seen in the following publications. Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists. Welcome to this edition of Ableton On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've always been your host, Lauren Seiler. On, on this um, edition, before we get to our guest, uh, Dan Grunberg of Montpelier Alive, we would like to say special thanks to our sponsors, Washington County Mental Health, Green Mountain Support Services, and many, many others. Um, we would like to welcome Dan Grunberg of Montpelier Alive to Able Then On Air. Thanks welcome for having me. Welcome to Able Then On Air. Um, tell us the missions and goals of Montpelier Alive. Sure. And what, they, and what you guys do for the city of Montpelier, Vermont. Great. Montpelier Alive is a community and economic development organization with a mission of making Montpelier a more livable and vibrant community by celebrating our downtown, which is really um, the heart and soul of Montpelier and what I think makes Montpelier a really special community. Mm -hmm. uh, we're one of uh, 23 similar organizations across the state in different cities and municipalities. Uh, and we work in sort of four areas. One is economic development, uh, specifically focused on supporting our small businesses, uh, especially the downtown businesses. Uh, one area is downtown beautification, and that's everything from flowers and benches to public art uh, work. Uh, one area is events, and we do a lot of our own events, and we also support other events in the community. And one is sort of promotion and marketing, uh, spreading the word about Montpelier and what's going on to locals and visitors. Mm -hmm. And when you say min, uh, when you say municipalities, what um, exactly do you mean by the uh, municipalities um, about that? Yeah, so we're uh, one of the three, 23 designated downtown organizations. So the state of Vermont has a program called uh, the Downtown Designation Program. And it's uh, communities of a certain size that meet certain criteria. So, um, you know, anyone from Montpelier, Brattleboro, Rutland, uh, Waterbury, um, Springfield, um, communities that have sort of a traditional downtown where there's lots of things going on that uh, need supporting. Okay. Well, um, exactly how does your organization mesh or help the special needs community? Or how would your organization do that? Yeah. Or what have you done to help the special needs community within your organization? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I would say that Montpelier Live uh, does work for everyone in the community, everyone who lives here, visits, or works here. Um, and so, you know, I can't necessarily point to a specific thing that's been specifically targeted towards, um, you know, people with disabilities, but I would say that 
you know, our events, we try and have really accessible and open to everyone. Um, our public artwork is visible, you know, we worked with the Public Art Commission on the new mural on the side of the Shaw's building. That's mm -hmm. something that um, makes Montpelier more beautiful for everyone. Um, having a really vibrant um, downtown business community is something that's great for everyone. Um, more specifically, we have worked with the Center for Independent Living and hosted a workshop for downtown businesses on how they yeah. can improve ADA compliance in their businesses. Mm -hmm. um, We've also um, had an audit of our July 3rd Independence Day event, which is, um, as you know, one of the biggest events in Montpelier each year. Um, the, because it's a, an event we do with the city of Montpelier, the city's uh, ADA committee um, brought in an outside consultant to help review that event to make sure that everything we do is really um, accessible to everyone. And, you know, there were some small suggestions, like, you know, making sure that food trucks were you know, if their window was up too high for someone using a wheelchair, that, um, you know, someone in the food truck could come around and help assist people, things like that. But um, overall, what it found was that our event, like many of our events, is really um, available for everyone. Okay. Um, now, you mentioned, I know this is past, and then you can go through some of the other events that you guys have. Explain how the July 3rd, um, event came about and, and why you guys decided to start that because it's a huge, you know, a lot of people say, why not July 4th? But um, <laughs> go ahead. So at this point, I, th I want to say it was 22 years ago, um, Bev Hill, who was at the time uh, assistant city manager, I believe, for the city of Montpelier, um, decided that Montpelier should have uh, fireworks um, on Independence Day and not wanting to compete with the neighboring smaller communities that already had events on the 4th, like Worcester, for example, um, decided to have the event on the 3rd um, at, so that people could do both. The, the Warren Parade is another example that's on the 4th that's a local favorite. We didn't mm -hmm. want to compete with them. Um, well, so, well, it would be a conflict of interest? No, or? no, no. Just that people love to go to that event and we wanted people to be able to go to both if they wanted to mm -hmm. um, so that they didn't have to choose between the two um, and it's sort of grown from there over the years um, and so now if you come to that event you'll see uh, fireworks but also music throughout the day family events a parade a mile road race we had 35 food trucks this year um, it's just sort of a big festival that takes over town uh, and we had 12,000 people in attendance this year so it's a really big event Okay. Uh, COVID, you know, COVID shut down a lot of things from, uh, from medical doctors, people having problems with that, to outside um, uh, organizations like uh, Montpelier Alive doing events. How did, how did COVID uh, impact you guys and uh, what... Um, you know, did you guys have anything in this in, uh, in this place online or something during COVID? Yeah. Um, how, how did that uh, work out? Yeah. So you know, first and foremost, I would say that Montpelier Live is a community building organization, mm -hmm. um, and the biggest thing that the pandemic impacted was the ability to come together as a community. <laughs> um, so that made it really, really challenging and made our job that much more important. So. Um, you know, we did at the very beginning of the pandemic, we did some sort of fun event things that you could do at home to bring the community together. We had a community sing where we invited everyone to go out on their front porch at their own house and provided, you know, three songs that everyone was going to sing together and people could sing together and enjoy that. Um, and, uh, you know, joined in with, there was a time where people were banging on pots and pans to support, um, uh, essential workers, you know, every night at six o'clock or something like that and promoted that. Um, but, you know, we decided that we weren't going to really pivot to online events because our whole goal is to bring people together sort of in person. Is online community. or was online events, um, or how can I word this, would it be impossible to do no, an online cer event? Certainly not, and we supported a lot of other organizations that were doing online events. I think of um, Scrag Mountain Music as an example. We provided a grant to them to support an event they were doing, which was 
uh, concerts, after hours in businesses to bring attention to the business and also um, provide a fun event for people online. But uh, we really as an organization wanted to think of ways that we could, you know, safely bring people together um, in person where possible. Okay, um, talking about um, accessibility for a minute and accessible venues, yeah. um, um, because a couple of weeks back we've had the Montpelier Parks Department mm -hmm. on talking about uh, accessibility with parks. How important is accessibility when it comes to doing events either outside or indoors, um, especially in the city of Montpelier? Because uh, now I know that the city is planning to fix the pavement and they're fixing other things within the city uh, municipality. How important is accessibility uh, for events within your organization? It's very important. We want everything we do to be available to as many people as possible. So most Montpelier Live events take place outdoors mm -hmm. in venues that happen to be accessible. Uh, we do some of our events on the State House lawn. We do some of them literally right on the street in downtown. Um, we do our summer concert series in Christ Church Courtyard. All of those venues are easily accessible for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we have events that take place indoors as well, like our Art Walk, uh, we make sure to indicate where they're, which venues are accessible and which ones are Explain, aren't. since you said art, 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 the Art Walk, explain a little bit about that event? Yeah. Go ahead. So Art Walk is an event that takes place six times a year. So it's every other month on the first Friday of the month. The next one will be the first Friday in October. Mm -hmm. um, and you have a Halloween also, right? We do Halloween. So yeah, that's a, another event. Yes. Um, and Art Walk is just a fun opportunity to um, see art by local and regional artists. Mm -hmm. And um, a variety of venues take place in it, um, we usually have between 20 and 25 different venues, which are both sort of traditional art galleries, mm -hmm. um, but also restaurants and stores that uh, display artwork and people can go around and discover the art, discover the, the business that they may not be familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just kind of fun, casual, start at whatever venue you want, go in whatever order you want, see as many things as you'd like to see. Um, and that's the first Friday of every other month, like I mentioned. Um, just a celebration of all the creativity in Montpelier. Tell me a little bit more about the history of Montpelier Alive and why you guys really exist. Because, you know, um, yes, there are um, community organizations, but there has to be more historical behind it. Yeah. Um, so we were originally started uh, in actually the 1990s. Um, and at the time, it was the downtown merchants who were really pushing for the creation of the organization to um, help them band together um, and be able to do more together. Uh, you know, they wanted to promote themselves, they wanted to hold events, but, uh, you know, they're very busy running their businesses and didn't have the time to do that necessarily. So, so it was originally called... The um, Downtown Merchants well, the, Association? Or? Yeah, so um, it's gone by various names at various times, but it was originally sort of the Montpelier Business Association, and we grew out of that. It was Montpelier on the move mm. uh, for a time, and then in 1999, it was founded as Montpelier Downtown Community Association uh, and rebranded as Montpelier Live, I believe, in 2006. Okay. Um, so now, in terms of... Your website. Um, how has your and, and I'm looking at it, and it's a wonderful website. How has your website um, changed, especially when it comes to accessibility? Sure. Um, well, we just launched a brand new website about two months ago, mm -hmm. uh, working with a firm called Eggworks in Waterbury, so a local yeah. firm. Um, and our, the goal of our website is to make all the amazing things about Montpelier that you and I know about from living here. Um, available to everyone um, to tell people about the upcoming events, whether that's a concert or a lecture at the library or anything like that, to share our outdoor recreation opportunities, to share all the great dining that we have and, uh, you know, downtown shopping that we have, uh, both for people who live in Montpelier who might not be keeping up with everything that's going on, but also for people who are interested in visiting Montpelier. Um, and, you know, so the, the new website incorporates all the, you know, latest technology and is really um, 
great for people who have you know need to use a screen reader um, you know making sure that there's alt text on the photos things like that um, that was definitely a focus as we developed the new website okay now um, I noticed that during the pandemic and this is a big question um, the restaurant industry mm. has taken a huge hit um, you know some uh, some things closed uh, within Montpelier, and then some things open. Like there, there's a new bakery that just opened. Tell me a little bit of, of more about how the restaurant industry has impacted Montpelier, but kind of come together to help at the same time. Yeah, sure. So Montpelier is very lucky in that we didn't lose any businesses as a direct result of the pandemic. Some businesses closed early in the pandemic, but they were actually planning to close anyway. Um, I'd say Necky is an example of that. Uh, you know, I didn't want to mention names. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, no. Um, but you know, there are, were some businesses that were you know in the midst of closing already or for sale already um, before the pandemic. But the pandemic itself didn't cause any businesses to close, and I really credit that with um, the businesses being really creative. Uh, they did know, more takeout. It, more it, takeout, um, you know, walk-up ordering windows, uh, some of them added delivery, um, all sorts of different ways that they pivoted um, to be more flexible. Outdoor dining, certainly, and parklets that the city um, encouraged more outdoor seating and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, um, what's a parklet, for those a, who don't know? Sure, a parklet is where, um, actually, so it's named after a parking spot. So where a business takes over uh, one or two parking spots on the street and turns it into outdoor dining with a, a sort of outdoor deck, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, so before the pandemic, there were two parklets in Montpelier. There's now, I believe, eight. Um, so a lot more outdoor dining options available for people. Um, and so you asked about what restaurants contribute to Montpelier. I think there's... Within the pandemic and or outside, sure. the pan, or outside the pandemic. Sure. So there's obviously this big legacy from the Culinary Institute being here, but also from just amazing Vermont produce and dairy and all that. There's great food here, right? Um, so we have, you know... A Especially really, cer certain ones like Julio's, for example. Yeah, well, Julio's they, they has do been a lot there of, for 40 they, years or something they, like that. They do a lot of outdoor dining. Yeah. yeah go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think it's pretty cool that little Montpelier with 8,000 people has 20 some odd restaurants, right? That's pretty impressive. And we have Thai food and Vietnamese food and Mexican food and quite a variety for a small town, I would say. So restaurants are really important to our community and food, obviously. Um, during the pandemic, uh, I think people broadly realized the importance of supporting local businesses, whether that was restaurants or retail stores. This has you know, always been a community that's cared a lot about our local business, but I think that um, people took it to the next level, you know, buying gift cards to businesses to use later when they reopened or, um, you know, getting, takeout Tuesday was sort of a trend nationally, but um, especially here where people would eat out more often to support local restaurants. Mm -hmm. So um, it's been, it has been really challenging though. Um, in spite of the state grants and federal grants that have really supported. Are you talking about the PPP loans? I'm talking about PPP, I'm talking about the EIDL, I'm talking about the state, um, I can't remember the names, that's how long ago it was at this point, but the state uh, grant programs that they provided for businesses as well. Um, so the state of Vermont provided money for restaurants to stay open, correct? For all sorts of businesses, but um, I'd say that restaurants were definitely in need at the time because they took the biggest hit. And that's what our data showed locally as well, is that restaurant business was down more than any other kind of business. Mm -hmm. uh, now, let's uh, talk about some more of the other events that you guys are, um, that you have in the winter, have in the spring. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, uh, we do July 3rd. Our next big event upcoming is on September 10th, which is our Taste of Montpelier Food Festival, appropriate we, to mention now since we were just food, talking about we food. food trucks. Food and <laughs> restaurants. Um, 
that was a new event that we started last year and really in part to help support Montpelier restaurants and mm. also to recognize that we have. What, so is it like a fundraising event? How, how yeah, does it work? Yeah, let me tell you about it. So um, there's, you know, also to celebrate all the food artisans in and around Montpelier and across Vermont. So um, it'll be all weekend we'll have things going on, but specifically on the 10th from 1 to 4, we'll take over State Street between Elm and Main and have food trucks, have... Um, Montpelier restaurants providing samples of their dishes. We'll have uh, tables from Vermont artisans like Cabot Creamery and uh, Cabot uh, and Vermont Creamery and Lake Champlain Chocolates and all sorts of uh, great you know vendors like that that are will be providing free samples. And then there'll also be a lot of fun street performers, a juggler and yo-yo artists and uh, brass bands and fun things like that. Okay, uh, now. Let's talk about the, um, well, in terms of pandemic, now that we're getting more people outside, let's talk about the farmer's market mm. in Montpelier for a minute. Um, it's um, It did a, a fundraiser recently for the food bank, um, or the Montpelier food bank had something to do with that, but how does the farmer's market help Montpelier or work with Montpelier alive or anything like that. Sure. So the farmer's market's a separate organization from us, but we work closely together because the farmer's market is one of the things that makes Montpelier a great place to live and to visit. Um, if you haven't been to the farmer's market in Montpelier, it's every Saturday from 9 to 1 at the 133 State Street parking lot, uh, just west of the State House. And a really incredible market for, again, you know, we're a pretty small community. Um, but we have, you know, 60 or 70 vendors at the farmer's market every week. And mm -hmm. Yankee Magazine, which is, you know, this New England-wide, well-regarded magazine, named it one of the best farmer's markets in New England. Um, I think it's really just a great celebration mm -hmm. of Vermont food. And it's also a really fun event uh, as a local to go to because you run into so many people you know. And it's a great sort of community it's vibe. Like, it's like everybody knows your name. The, exactly. That TV show. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of a bar, we have a farmer's market. <laughs> uh, pretty much. Um, is there anything that we haven't mentioned that's extremely important with your, your agency? Um, I think, you know, just that we're involved in really a big breadth of things in Montpelier. And um, we often serve as sort of a connector for people. So we'll have, you know, someone will, might email me and say, I'm working on this project, like, what do you think? And I'll say, oh, I actually know this other person who's working on something similar. You, you two should get together and talk about this. Or um, just bringing the community together in a lot of ways, and that's really what we're all about. And um, we're always open for suggestions and feedback of how we can serve anyone in Montpelier better. Where do you see, um, this might be a far-fetched question, mm -hmm. but where um, do you see, like, Montpelier businesses expanding for the, um, the special needs community, especially with accessibility, you know. Uh, um, do you see that uh, more coming up or, you know, um, I mean, a suggestion would be possibly to have uh, uh, businesses have more ramps outside their businesses. Uh, where do you see that uh, going forward then? Yeah, well, I... I was excited to host that workshop for the Montpelier businesses with the Center for Independent Living because a lot of businesses saw some like low-hanging fruit, let's call it, some easy things that they could do to make their businesses more accessible. Um, you know, there's a lot of projects that would require a lot more work. Um, you know, for we example? Have, well, we have a lot of historic buildings and oh, uh, some of them you know, don't necessarily have, you know, accessible entrances and are, you know... Um, because, it, for example, it took forever for the um, art gallery to get an elevator right. some time ago. Yeah, and that was an incredibly expensive project that took them several years to raise the money for. Um, so that's an example of how it's, it can be difficult in these historic buildings. It can be expensive. Um, but, you know, I, businesses care and are trying to, um, you know, be accessible for everyone and um, will always provide alternative methods of, you know, if you can't get physically get in the door, they're always happy to help you over the phone or something like that as well. Um, 
I will say that I think restaurants adding outside seating has added more options because all of that outside seating is accessible even in a case where the restaurant inside may not have been. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I think the, you know, I don't have any specific examples of upcoming work, but I know that it's something that the businesses care about and are thinking okay. about. Talk about some of the future goals of Montpelier Real Life, because as I understand it, you said off air that, well, we can say it on air, that you're leaving Montpelier Real Life. If you would like to um, plug that or um, why are you leaving Montpelier Real Life, and obviously for better uh, <laughs> things, but uh, how is that going to impact, uh, well, obviously it's not going to impact at all because you have somebody else, but um, go ahead if you want to mention Sure. That. Um, yeah, so Montpelier Live has been here for more than 20 years, and like you said, it's not going anywhere. Um, I'm, it's it's going to get better. I, it may get better without me. <laughs> um, I've been at Montpelier Live for four and a half years, and um, moving on to work for the state to do similar work at a statewide level, and I'm excited about that, but I know the organization will be in good hands under Katie Trouts, who's my colleague now, who will be interim director, and uh, we have a really great board who's really involved and engaged in the community, um, and I know we'll keep doing great work, and I think uh, the strategic focus is going to be continuing to grow um, our role as a partner and a collaborator and bringing together um, all the great work that's happening across Montpelier by many organizations. Mm -hmm. um, now, in terms of your website, uh, you have a, um, if you want to talk more about that, um, I notice here that uh, the Hunger Mountain Co-op has a, a brown bag concert series. We haven't mentioned. Uh, yeah, that. so our um, our brown bag summer concert series is uh, Hunger Mountain Co-op's the presenting sponsor, and that's a free summer concert series on Thursdays at noon um, in Christchurch Courtyard. Mm -hmm. uh, there'll be one uh, tomorrow. I don't know when this is going to air, so to speak, it, but there'll be well, one. Well, yeah, uh, it, um, uh, Thursdays. Pony in two weeks will air. This. Sure. Um, so through September 6th, I believe is the last date, um, there, you can find out more at montpelieralive.com slash brown bag. Um, but there, it's a series of six free concerts by local and regional artists and mm -hmm. uh, just a fun concert series that we do for people who want to grab a lunch and enjoy being Oh, done. grab a lunch or bring their lunch. Bring and... their lunch, exactly. Yep. Um, okay. So um, last thing I noticed here on your website, you have a... Um, section, let um, me click it for one minute. Um, oh yeah, it, it's called Shop. So you list the, um, it says here, Montpelier is the best small town for shopping, according to USA Today. That's Let's true, talk yes. Talk about that for So a in 2021, uh, USA Today 10 Best, which is uh, um, a USA Today property, uh, named Montpelier uh, the best small town for shopping in the United States. The top 10 was chosen by judges, uh, including journalists, um, from USA Today. Um, and then it was a, a vote to pick the top, uh, top one. Um, Montpelier has been in the top five for the last five years now. Um, so, you know, in 2022, we were number three. We fell, fell to number three. Um, but I still think, um, you know, for... A small town that we have an incredible array of shopping, and um, I think it speaks to. And I notice here, and it's in large print uh, for the visually impaired, um, that you have different um, uh, categories: food yeah. and drink, games, gifts. So you're listing all the businesses within those categories. Correct? Yeah, we have you know such a great variety of businesses, and I think the fact that we won this uh, recognition is because our business owners are really wonderful at what they do, and you know, you get great customer service and it's just a very different experience than walking into Walmart or shopping on Amazon, right? Where, um, you The know, Berlin it, Mall does need more stores. <laughs> uh, it's just a different experience, a more personalized experience with more unique products. And um, like you mentioned, we have everything from clothing stores to, you know, independent kids toy stores. Those, you know, Toys R Us doesn't even exist anymore, let alone... Uh, independent actually no they it's are coming back, back. back but um you know we have two independent bookstores we have you know hobbies craft stores um, so quite a variety which is really impressive for a small town mm -hmm. 
Well, uh, I would like to definitely thank you for joining me on this edition of Ableton On Air. For more information on Montpelier Alive and what they do and all the activities, especially the website is accessible for people with special needs, you can go to www.montpelieralive.com. Uh, and if you want to find out more about their sh uh, the shops in Montpelier, you can go to www.montpelieralive.com forward slash shop. So that's forward slash S-H-O-P. Again, the website is accessible for people with visual impairments uh, as well. So www.montpelieralive.com forward slash shop. Uh, shop. And if you want to find out more about Able Den On Air and what we do uh, here uh, for people with special needs and their families and um, other groups, uh, you can go to uh, Orca's website at www.orcamedia.net. That is www.orcamedia.net. This puts an end to this edition of Able Den On Air. Thank you to our sponsors, uh, Washington County Mental Health, Green Mountain Support Services, and the many partners, including Montpelier Alive for today's show, and also the Association for the Help of um, for the Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, the Associ uh, and the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired, and so many others. Thank you again. Um, Arlene is not here today. I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time for the next edition of Able Den On Air. Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to live home in the community, Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press, media editors, New York Pirate online newspaper, U.S. Press Corps Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, and Montpelier Sustainable Coalition, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Abel Den On Air has been seen in the following publications, Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, Boston, New England Chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists.